Um, so when George asked me to speak, I happened to be on a walk. I was on a walk with my love and one of my best friends who happened to be in town from Boston. We'd had a great show the night before performing. I had that little performer's high. I was getting ready to perform again the next night. We're on this walk, the sun is shining, the river is flowing. George is on the phone and he says things like, leader in the artistic community. And then he says, Asheville Fringe, which is a big part of my heart. And then he says, big wig at Leaf Global Arts. And I thought, big wig? I don't know if I'm okay with that word, George. Um, <laughs> Uh, it felt a little corporate and terrifying and huge. And then I remembered, well, he's talking about the arts, so that's okay. And then he told me that the theme was pride. Well, you may have noticed, or maybe not, I am super gay. And in case my haircut or my face or my voice or my clothes didn't give that away for you because all gay people have to look like this, right? Um, in case that didn't give it away, I have this necklace to tell you that I am super gay. For those of you in the back that may not have known, it's right there. <clears throat> so the things that make me good at experimental theater are the very things that make me bad at public speaking. Um, I checked with some of my friends. I'm like, I'm doing this thing. It was really exciting. You know, he asked me and the endorphins were pumping and my people were with me. And then the reality set in. What am I going to do? I can't just stand on stage and be gay and have that cover the theme. <laughs> <clears throat> so then my friends are like, you're okay on the mic. You're charming. You're lovable, it's fine. Um, my partner happened to say similar things. You're passionate and the teeniest bit awkward, just enough to make you charming on stage. <laughs> she might be in this room. Um, and then I remembered charming. I've been a theater person most of my life and charming is the thing you say when you're writing a review and you don't know what nice thing to say. <laughs> So let's just hope you all think I'm as cute and charming as she does, because you're in for a real treat. Okay, so the things that make me good at experimental theater. I am messy and organized, non-linear, very visual. You all look great. And um, I have ideas bursting in every direction at all times. I'm a little bit unpredictable. and. Um, a little self-deprecating. And how did I get to be a little self-deprecating? Well, evidence, life, birth, and parts of my upbringing. So I grew up on a 26-acre farm in Southern Ohio, and I mean like rural Southern Ohio. Um, I am the child of a very talented, intelligent, creative person who was 17 years old when she had me, um, pregnant by her 16-year-old boyfriend, who I never knew. And things weren't always great. I'm very fortunate to have a grandmother who stepped up, took care of me uh, when things were hard. But I have not always been the way that I am now. As I was trying to figure out what to say today, and I'm not sure I figured it out yet, um, I realized that I was wearing a shirt that says, Mother by Choice for Choice. This is absolutely something I believe in. I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole too much, but I believe a person has the right to do with their body as they please. And as a child to a 17-year-old, I have been told a number of times in my life had I known my choices, I wouldn't have had you. So again, I completely and fully wholeheartedly believe that people get to choose with their bodies whatever they want. And I didn't start out quite understanding that. So I stand here today, I am a gender non-conforming, somewhat masculine presenting, vegetarian, 
a mother of adopted children who happen to be biracial and both are neurodivergent, and one of which is also gender non-conforming, and I drive a Subaru. <laughs> That's real. Um, but as I said, I didn't start out that way. So as a kid, I went to a Christian school for the first five years of my life. Good education, nothing wrong with that. I was a quiet child, quiet and um, a little sheltered, and definitely God-fearing. And when I say God-fearing, I really mean that. So um, I remember when I was pretty little, I was running around the house, misbehaving, being a little sassy, which I was shy, but not to my grandma, she was my people. So, um, you know, probably saying some stuff I shouldn't have said, doing something I shouldn't have done, and I take off running through the living room, and I run into the coffee table, it hits my leg, I fall flat on my face. I'm crying, not right now, but then, um, and it hurt, it hurt really bad, and my grandma said, well, that was Jesus. He stuck his leg out from under that coffee table and tripped you because you were being bad. And I believed it so hard that I saw it. I saw Jesus' leg <laughs> out from under that coffee table. And the thing is, you may not have known until today, but Jesus wears blue jeans and cowboy boots. And I believed it though, like some real hardcore 1980s gaslighting happened because I'm like, yes, he did. And I saw it and his leg was there and that image has stayed with me forever. Yeah, so at this point I feel like I've lived 75 different lives in this one lifetime. Um, you know, as a quiet, isolated child, I also came from a really big family. I was the seventh child that my grandmother raised. So on holidays and sometimes weekends, we had a huge, full, very loud house. Um, my mother got married and divorced and remarried a few times. So I have had a smattering of step and half brothers and sisters. I have lived as the oldest child, the only child, the middle child and the youngest child at various points in my life. And I feel like that's helped me in a number of ways and also helped me not quite know where I fit in a number of ways. My mom always told me that I was fiercely independent. I think the part of that story that she leaves out is I became fiercely independent for survival. And what's important to me is connection. So thank you for being here and making that part of what I get to do. Um, connection and community and relationships because that's what I needed to figure out how to do to survive. Now I mentioned I'm not a good public speaker and what's even worse, I am very, very, very non-linear. I can't figure out how to get from one section to my talk to the next, so you guys are gonna help me again. <laughs> So um, some of the work that I do is based on the work of the neo-futurists and the audience gets to choose, right? So these are three different of my life stories. I may or may not do all three of them, so choose wisely. But when I say go, you're gonna yell out the title of a story and I'm gonna tell you about that part of my life. Everybody got it? Go. <laughs> You all are so, so loud. Donut story. Donut story. Donut story. Thank you. Fringe performer. She got, she got it. Um, okay. Donut story. So when I was in college, which was uh, about three hours from where my mom lived at the time, my parents at the time, and I had just come out. Um, Things were hard. I was working for five fifteen an hour. That's five dollars fifteen cents an hour in the theater, and um, I didn't always have a place to stay. And I was feeling really tired and really stressed. But the theater was my safe space, and I remember going in there, walking into the theater um, to paint to work on a set, and just feeling like I didn't know what there what there was left. And I walk around to go downstairs to the shop and I see this box of donuts behind the flat. I don't know how to tell you 
how much that changed things for me. That moment I have taken with me my entire life since then. Um, I figured out that it was one of my professors who sort of knew what was going on at home and knew the struggle I was having, and she left these donuts. Not with a note, I can't remember how I figured it out, but what I remembered is I felt like someone noticed and someone cared. And that is all I'm gonna say in that story, and you can tell me one more. What do you want me to do next? Left at the mall! Left at the mall! Oh, this one's sad, I think. Um, <laughs> because the donut one was really happy. <laughs> All right, so um, mentioned rural, southern Ohio. That word is hard to say. Can you all say rural? rural? Yeah, you guys are so much better at it than me. It's weird, there's so many R's. Anyway, um, so the closest place to go shopping um, at the mall was about an hour drive. Now, when I would come home on breaks from college, um, my mom really liked to go shopping. This is not a thing that we agreed on. Um, this is not a fun time for me. However, I would agree because I knew it was important to her, a thing I did for most of my life. Um, and I would ride to the mall with her. And invariably, she would get mad at me. It could have been because she wanted to buy me clothes and I wasn't into the pink and floral. Pink's cool now, but then it wasn't for me. Um, so I w wouldn't be into the pink and the floral or the shoes with a heel or whatever it may be. Um, I was told a lot, Erin, you're a girl. I do know that. And I like to wear pants. So, um, or it could have just been that she was hangry. Almost always, no matter what, she would get upset and leave me. So here I am, 19, 20 years old, an hour away from home, three hours away from college. I had no concept of what a taxi was, who's gonna take a taxi, Uber wasn't a thing. So I learned early on to carry a calling card and some quarters and find a payphone. And at that point, I had made enough connections in my life to be able to make a phone call to one of my college friends who lived four hours away, or another who lived six hours away, and they would drive across the state to pick me up and take me back to their family home for the rest of the break. I told you it was a little sad. Um, do you want one more, or should I move on? Yeah. What was the last one? I don't remember. Student life. Oh, I'll try to be quick with this one because, you know, it's like kind of the same theme and you get it. So, um, like I said, I came out when I was in college and um, I happened to be pretty lucky that even though I was in a small town still in Ohio, central Ohio at this point, um, that some of the student life uh, staff also happened to be queer. And I think some of them caught wind of how hard things could be for me at home and they gave me tips on how I could stay at campus over break and get away with it. Um, they told me to go to the dining hall during the hours um, that RAs, the resident assistants, the RAs were there for training, um, that I could just sneak in, nobody would think twice about it, and what time to turn off the lights in my house so campus police wouldn't notice. Um, I have learned that taking risks is really important. I have had to take risks for survival. Um, taking risks, giving people a chance, learning who you can connect with, to me has always been worth it. Now there are a few times where that has not worked out. That has burned me really bad. Um, but for the most part, it's worth it. Um, I moved here about 15 years ago, and I had a few friends from college that lived here. It's weird, small world but I didn't have um, my, I did, hadn't made my community yet. So I started doing Devise Theater. Devise Theater is ensemble created theater. Um, and to do something like Devise Theater, you have to create these types of relationships. So I used my survival skills and I met people and I set up situations where they could learn to trust each other and spend time together and be really vulnerable on stage to create a piece of non-linear art, because that is how my brain works, that is how this talk is working. 
Um, and I found my people. And that group keeps expanding. Many of you are in this room. Um, I am also the artistic director and co-festival director of Asheville Fringe. And um, yeah, Fringe. And uh, that is a place where uh, people outside of the mainstream get to make their art, which is super important to me. And some of the feedback we've gotten is that Asheville Fringe, there are fringes all over the world, Asheville Fringe is the best that people have been to because of the community, because we, we create a space for volunteers and performers and artists and designers and uh, venue owners to get to know each other in a real way. I also happen to be the associate director at Leaf Global Arts. I started out as a teaching artist and then I worked in education, now I'm the associate director. And I get to connect with people from all over the world. Um, a couple months ago, I sat at a dinner with people from 17 different countries. And some of them come back twice a year. And I can say that I have connections with these people all around the world. Um, I was asked what the goal is when I make theater. And the goal for me is that the audience leaves the room and find somebody to talk with, and you talk for hours. I have found that with my work, people, someone may have a really strong, like, I know what that piece meant, I totally get it, remember this is pretty abstract, this is exactly what it means, and they tell to somebody else and they're like, no, and they say exactly what they thought it meant and they feel equally as passionate. I tell my cast, never, never tell them where this piece comes from because we want them to connect with it. But what I really want to come from that is the audience speaking with each other so that those connections spider web out into our community. I didn't talk a lot about how we make those pieces, but I would like to give you a homework assignment that is an example of how I would begin to make a piece of work like this. So every piece that you create, since you're in my ensemble now, not like five to 12, but 100 will do. Um, so every piece that you write has to have a beginning, middle, and an end in something of your life that is real. Um, for this assignment, you have to think of a piece that has one other person, you have to incorporate actual water, and your theme is pride. So we're gonna keep going after I stop talking because you're gonna think about this on your way home, sometimes in the shower, I don't know, mowing the lawn, whatever it is that you do, and you're gonna think about how you would show your story. Not tell your story, but show your story. And that's what I have for today. I'm doing the thing. All right, thank you, Aaron, so much. Uh, we're gonna open it up uh, to Q&A right now. Does anybody have any questions for Aaron? Hi. Yes. What friend did you call? What friend did I call? When you were left in the mall. I had two friends. Um, one was my best friend named Aaron. Back then we had landlines. It was real weird when people called for one or the other. We never knew, but that was fun. And then the other person's name was Jackie, and she lived in uh, Northern Ohio, just outside of Akron. Oh, this happened more than once. And I called each of them at least once. Yeah. Anybody else have a, anybody? Anybody else have a question? Yes, you. Where did you go to school and where did you live in Ohio? Where okay. did you go to school and where did you live in Ohio? So I grew up in Adams County, Ohio. It's about an hour east of Cincinnati on the Kentucky border. Um, I went to school at Muskingum University. At the time, it was Muskingum College. Muskingum? Muskingum, yep. Muskingum. And that was in southeastern Ohio, closer to the middle. And then I went to grad school at the University of Minnesota. Uh, is Muskingum, is that like, go Wildcats, go? You know what? You don't know? I do know, and it's funny. <laughs> We were the muskies. Does anybody know what a muskie is? Uh-uh. It's a fish with teeth. We were the fish with teeth. The fish yeah. with teeth. Okay. Go fish with teeth. Right. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, yes. I'm curious because you've been here for a while. Everyone likes to lament and complain about the state of the arts and the theater and you know, how things have changed. Um, I'm just kind of curious from your perspective being immersed here. You know, are you seeing you know, uh, any kinds of shifts or you know, what is your opinion of the state of fringe in Asheville? Are, okay, she's asking, are you seeing any kinds of shifts 
in the arts or in fringe in the Asheville area? Well, why do you have to ask me hard questions? <laughs> Um, I think that the arts community is expanding in the time that I've been here. I think people are more open to trying new things. I think the Fringe Arts Festival um, in itself, it's been 22 years strong and um, we continue to grow and um, I'm seeing leadership and theaters turn over and change and people be willing to try uh, things that they've never tried before and audiences to come to shows that they probably wouldn't have five or ten years ago. Okay. Yes. Uh, so speaking of uh, French, what, what do you hope shows up? Like what kind of content are you hoping would maybe be shown for the first time in French? All the weird stuff. <laughs> no. So what? <laughs> I'm not very good at yes and. Um, no, okay. So the the biggest part of the mission of Fringe for me is uh, to be able to produce affordable work that lies outside of the mainstream. Um, it's important to me that people put themselves out there, try new things, take big risks. Uh, that's been a huge part of the work that I do. And, um, you know, make connections, try new things. I personally, I guess maybe this is what you were asking, I personally am a fan of physical theater, and I like anything that's really um, gritty and tells a personal story in a creative way without telling your story. Is that it? Yeah, physical theater, that's the thing, physical theater. And um, sometimes we're challenged to find venues that have high ceilings and room for that. We don't, we don't know of any, we don't know of okay. any venues like yep. that, no. Sure. Uh, well, has anyone seen anything really, I'm not gonna use the word bizarre, offbeat, interesting, unique, unorthodox at the Fringe Festival here in the past, yeah? Anybody wanna share a thing they saw that was like? No, the dancing vagina and penis. The dancing vagina and penis? Right, was it a slow dance? Okay. Um, Sometimes. Uh, yes. A lesbian sci-fi space opera. A lesbian sci-fi space opera. So good. Yeah? yeah. All right. Tithonia by Sky Sail Theater. Okay. Uh, anybody have any questions? Any more questions for Aaron? Where? Oh. Who? Yeah. Um, what is, do you have any works, either recent or upcoming, that you're really proud of that we could you know, learn more about? So Anamkara Theater that I founded has um, an offshoot experimental theater. Uh, some of our work is based off of the neo-futurists of Chicago. Um, we used to produce work every other month. It's a really quick rotating ensemble, new work, new theme every month. And then we stopped. Our lives got super, super busy and uh, a lot of things changed for a lot of people. Pandemic hit, I thought we would never do it again. We took a six year break, and just this past weekend, we came back together with, uh, some of the with all of the ensemble members in different ways that were in our last show six years ago. And we created a new show. Um, it was called Accordion Time Machine, Back in the Habit. Cool. Anyone else? No, oh, yes. Oh, sure. Oh, yes. I'm curious, are there any like, workshops or classes or ways for people to casually play with your theater? Oh, good. Ooh. I'm so glad you So asked. she's asking, are there any workshops or classes that people can casually play with weird theater? So um, I am sometime soon to be determined collaborating with the Magnetic Theater and Anamkara Theater to teach a workshop that leads up to a performance. Um, so it's a workshop on device theater teaching with my lovely partner Molly Graves back there. And um, I will just, maybe you'll watch Magnetic for dates because we've got to figure them out. Yeah, but I, come play, please. Okay, well, please, again, give it up for Aaron Hartley. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.